Okay, cool. Uh, looks like we're good to go here. Uh, welcome, everyone. Uh, we're going to be going into our live talk right now into the creation of not only just my dynamic Bible, but also about basically um, creating books for yourself, uh, being able to actually, um, you know, start off on, on even just the intention of how to explore the idea of, uh, oops, sorry about that. Hold on one second. Turn the speaker off there for a second. Okay, cool. Hopefully you can hear me fine. Um, questions I can read off of the YouTube channel. So if you guys have questions here and there, I will definitely try to answer them the best I can. Please do understand that I won't be able to maybe get to all of them because if the chat goes through, I may not be able to go back. I'll try to speak as concisely, clearly, as slowly as I can. Uh, that is definitely one of the, the problems sometimes. If I have a lot of information, I tend to kind of spill it all out really quickly. So as I said, uh, if you miss something, just kind of even ask like, hey, could you repeat that again? Or could you slow it down slightly? I'll try to do so. Uh, real fast, for those people that are joining for the first time and uh, don't know anything about what I do, uh, I have been teaching a lot of the fundamentals and drawing sketching for over 10 years, places like at the Art Center College and whatnot. Uh, I've been working in the industry for concept art and games uh, for about seven years. And overall, uh, it's been a lot of different experiences working in interactive, working in things like fashion, doing things like illustration, gallery shows, and also then books as well, publishing books. So I kind of want to give you guys a bit of the history in terms of how I started working on books, uh, getting to a certain point. I might, I'm even going to show you an evolution of the uh, quality changes and, and also, of course, how I did them as well. From up to that point, we're going to talk about that maybe about 20, 30 minutes or so. Uh, and then from there, we're going to switch over to drawing as well. I'm going to show you guys how to actually lay out a sketch page. And it may not seem, doesn't seem like that, I guess, uh, detrimental in your approach towards just sketching and drawing. But in actuality, being able to organize your page uh, in a cordial, in a, in a very clear and consistent manner has a lot of professionalism, but it really helps later on in like book creations as well, too. All right. So at first, I'm going to kind of start right off into showing you guys a lot of different kinds of books from my past uh, and up to even some of the present uh, stuff as well, too. All right. OK, so what I'm going to do is just kind of readjust a couple of things here in terms of my camera and also desk. So give me one second. Uh, let's switch it over. What you'll see right now popping up is the overhead camera. OK, so you see my hands. And we're going to have some books here that we can take a look at. Give me one second as I also focus on the camera. Gallery, let's pin my video. And there we go. OK. Uh, so here are a couple sketchbooks. as well as a huge assortment of other books. I'm gonna go through all of these as, as briskly as I can uh, because I have many more here as well too. Okay, a um, couple questions here is first, uh, I think I missed one from above. Sorry, just kind of reading this for a second. Um, Will I be able to watch this later on? Uh, that's the plan for this being on YouTube channel on Kazone. Uh, you should be able to go back and watch this again when this is finished up. So if you wanna go back and kind of get some of the information again, some things you missed, or if you have to leave right now and then come back later on, you'll be able to watch it later on, okay? So first and foremost, I wanna share you guys with some books that I have here. And it seems kind of random with a whole bunch of assortment of different kind of books that are up here. Let me zoom out a bit more. Let's move some stuff out of the way. Let's just start off with the kind of the start of some stuff here. I have all this stuff, but let's just start with even these. This book in particular, uh, these two right here, are old books from 2001, all right? So this is when I was uh, probably, what, 20, 21 years old myself, 20, 21, um, quite a while ago now. And this is when I was beginning, you know, my college years at places like the Art Center College. So I want to start with these just to kind of show you like what my sketchbooks looked like at the time. Uh, this is before I took a lot of my training. You know, I was sketching out quite often, even as a student, uh, you know, up into my high school years, even before that, I was doing constant drawing and sketching. So I'm going to go through some of these here uh, to see you know, what I have. And or, <laughs> I haven't looked at these in a long time, by the way. I just kind of found them recently. Um, let's take a look at what we got here. So this is like old stuff, a lot of pencil work, uh, a lot of uh, ballpoint work as well, too. 
So this is from 2001, all right? So notice that a lot of the interests that I've had were things like character stuff. I used to do a lot of like um, figurative work as well too, right? These are just figurative studies. So these, some of these were like from classes in my very first year at Art Center. Uh, some of the stuff is just personal. A lot of them will be referencing. A lot of them will be from photographs. A lot of them will be also from observation. So looking at models or, you know, these are all reference shots and photographs as well too. Uh, so these are the kind of sketches that will be producing at that age again, 20 years ago now. Um, I won't, I'm not gonna go through every single page in detail, but I just kind of flip through some of them as I go. And these are 20 years old, okay? Uh, so don't judge too harshly, please. But of course, you know, as I look back on this stuff, it's like, well, you know, this is, I don't mind this too much either. Looking back on it, I can kind of see the, the training and, and whatnot and doing a lot of master copies of certain artists, right? So doing a lot of pencil work and ballpoint work. That was kind of like my main tool sets. Yeah, a lot of pencil back then, a lot of erasing too. And of course you start to even see the interests that I've had, you know, comics, uh, a lot of manga artists, animations, um, Western comics of like, you know, Marvel and DC as well. A lot of compositional little thumbnail studies for things like classes and also. This is inspired by, you know, the Katsuhiro Tomo work. And just various amount of just stuff, you know, studying Soriyama, uh, Soriyama stuff over here too. And then even doing more anatomical studies. So these are from directly classes, doing ballpoint to then pencil work on top. Side, back. And then also even, I remember these, uh, these sections right here from when I was actually uh, taking the class of anatomy study and we would draw from cadavers. So we went to the college here locally in LA, the uh, USC Medical Center, and we would actually draw from cadavers. So these are the studies from hands, joints, cartilage, muscle, um, real bodies. And we work with the medical students there. They would show us things, move things around, kind of see how the anatomy works. They would start to pull on certain tendons to see which you know, kind of like limbs would move and, and such. And of course, still playing with things of my own inter interest. And I get a lot of questions about things like balance, right? Being able to draw the things you like to draw, but also the training part of things. The idea of like drawing things that are part of practice. Um, when I was in school, again, this is when I was like 21 years old, uh, I would be training, right? Training. But then also I would constantly just draw stuff that I liked. What you'll notice a lot of times in my figurative stuff is I always cut off the feet. So whenever I see people's sketchbook, the thing that I got called out on a long time ago was you don't seem to complete your figures. <laughs> you know, you just draw the upper torso. You just draw the upper torso. Uh, and I never really finished out full figures. And the reason why was because I was actually really bad at drawing the figure in full proportion. Uh, I, I, I never could get the proportion really good in terms of the length of the leg. It was just an issue and a problem that I had in the past. So I always avoided it. I was just knee up, you know, knee up. Uh, and I, honestly, a lot of this stuff was also somewhat kind of a uh, subconscious, I guess. I wasn't consciously choosing to do that. I think it's just because I knew I didn't really do it so well. It, internally, I was just kind of avoiding it. You know, that's it. Oh, I'm going to draw from knee up now. But it was just always kind of happening naturally. It was a pattern that was formulating. So in the past, again, I mean, sometimes once in a while, I would draw the full figure here and there and try to do it. But then a lot of times it would just be knee up, right? So when you guys see certain potential habits that you do, see, cut off the feet again, habits that you do because you feel uncertain about it, you're not very confident about the thing, first, it's gotta be called out to you. So this is where like feedback helps so much. Sometimes, you know, some of these kind of things, I wasn't even aware that I was even doing, you know, but I knew that I was concerned about it, even afraid about doing that kind of stuff because I knew it wasn't looking very good. But sometimes being called out, telling you, you know, someone telling you, hey, by the way, you're doing this. Uh, now I can't stop thinking about it. I have to draw the full figure now, right? So, but these are, like I said, the old, old stuff. Um, that kind of happened a lot. This is a, a second book from that same year. So I kind of finished that book out and went into this one. This is right before I was taking the dynamic sketching classes myself. So I'll still be drawing the figure, right? Chest up, knee up, <laughs> right? Over and over again. Once in a while, play with it. But I'm just showing you guys these old books. I'm gonna show you the kinds of drawings that I will be doing. First, also then take note of the fact that when I use the layout of the page, it's just kind of random. It's just more like, oh, I have a space right there, I'll draw. I have a space right there, I'll draw. And I got space open and I'll just use that space to fill it up, right? So it wasn't necessarily well thought out as to where I wanted to put the drawings on my page. It was more of an opportunity and availability or whatever the case is. Sometimes I try to fill the entire page in, 
um, or just be a section of it. I will leave another part of it out. It's kind of like leaving the crust of bread alone, right? So you eat a sandwich and you leave that crust out. Uh, it was kind of felt like that on sketchbooks also. Like I'll draw a section of it, but I didn't want to finish the rest of it. It's like, oh, I'll go to the next page, right? Um, a lot of, again, characters and stuff like that I like. But you, as you'll notice, a lot of character-driven stuff, a lot of half characters, half characters. And a lot of this stuff, like, like I said, will be made up. I will be imagining these things. And some of them will be studies. So this will be a portrait study from a certain artist, mostly pencil to ballpoint, making stuff up, just having around, you know, playing around, having fun. A lot of them are influenced, as I said, from artists that I've observed, uh, manga artists to Western artists, classical artists, and kind of, you know, bridging them all together, uh, playing with it, playing with things like mythology, cultures, uh, movies. Terminator, <laughs> right? Studies anatomy. Cutting out the feet, <laughs> right? So when I look back on this kind of work and I see that I see myself doing that a lot, and I'm like, oh man, I didn't realize it's so so bad. Um, but there are still things I look back on. It's like, oh, I mean, there's some really cool stuff, and, and I'm, I was happy that I was able to sketch freely, you know, as it was, um, and it was just constant drawing, constant drawing. But this is, of course, when I was in school. But a lot of this work here is not for homework. A lot of this stuff was because I just wanted to have fun drawing. So yesterday's talk in the demo for Proco, I talked a lot about that. You know, the idea of being able to just draw because you want to draw and because it was just something that was really fun to do. And no matter what it was, uh, and of course, leading to an interest was a huge aspect to it. Uh, and then from there, being able to actually just go into it, you know. Anyways, so those were like early, early sketchbooks. What I want to show you next is now published, not really published, but produced books books. I'm going to show you a little bit of an order in which they were created. I'm going to talk a bit about this because this is right now, you know, culminating down to the latest book that I have out from Superani, uh, which of course is the Dynamic Bible, right? So this is the latest book I've put out. Uh, what was it like earlier this year, last year? So, um, you know, of course, this is what the book currently looks like, right? So all my notes and sketches and process from the class that I've, you know, taught now for a decade. Uh, but Getting to this point, and I've shown you now an early, early sketchbook from 20 years ago. This is what I'm doing at the very much moment right now, right? Uh, I want to show you how it started from leaving school, working in full time, you know, as being an artist and designer, uh, developing my own projects and stuff like this, and then eventually now moving into producing my own content. So for those of you that have any interest of developing your own little books, I'll talk a bit about how you're going to want to do this. Uh, so first, again, like I said, let's share the actual little books themselves and kind of give you a history. I'm going to keep track of time. So at 4.12 right now, we'll go about 15 minutes, and then we're to switch over to some drawing. I'm going to talk about then how to lay out some pages. I was working uh, full-time in the video game industry from 2005 uh, to about 2013, that many number of years. When I first started in, in the industry in games, you know, I worked in LA, and then I moved down to uh, San Diego. Sorry, is the audio really low for anybody else? Let me, if I have to adjust my microphone, I will, but give me a little bit of feedback on audio if it's necessary. Uh, good, okay, thank you. So in 2008, I moved down to San Diego and I was working for another game studio out there. And around that time, I only was working full time, all right? Uh, I was working at a game studio, nine to five, come home, go to the gym, that was it. I would sketch here and there, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't really pursue a lot of other things like actual projects and whatnot. It wasn't until 2008 that I got an opportunity to go to Comic-Con in San Diego and to be able to actually present and have a table and, a, and a, basically to share my work. Obviously, if you guys have been to expos and Comic-Con, even like Lightbox back two years ago when it was uh, in person, you know, you would go to an artist and they have their table and you can pick up their stuff and you could potentially buy it, right? So I had to imagine like, okay, well, how and what would I sell? So I said, well, everyone seems to be making small little sketchbooks. So I guess I'll make one also. Uh, so I went into um, my collection of sketches in my old, old, you know, sketchbooks and whatnot in 2008, and I started gathering old sketch work. So I produced this book. This is my first book I ever made for myself back in 2008. And uh, it's this crappy little, you know, staple bound book that I stapled myself. I went to Kinko's, which is like a little, you know, a local uh, copy center, essentially, and I printed one original out from uh, Photoshop onto my printer. And I took it to Kinko's and I then photocopied all of them, okay? And I made about 60 of these books, all right? 
And the book itself, it just contains like old sketches from 2007, 2008. Some of the stuff was at the la latter end of when I also finished Art Center. So there's an old, old sketch work as well too. I'm glad you were there, say something. Uh, where do you find the Dynamite Bible? Go to superunnyus.com, superunnyus.com, or liberdistry, liberdistry.com as well. Um, you can find the book still available, the new Dynamic Bible there now. In terms of the question of when's the next one coming out, I'm hoping next year in the summer. That's the plan. So anyways, you know, I made this book, produced it, and it was fun. And I went to Comic-Con, and I put it out there, and, you know, I was trying to sell this stuff. But, uh, you know, people sometimes picked it up and bought it, and other ones didn't. I think I sold about maybe 10 okay uh, these are like ten ten dollars a pop uh went to comic-con sold a few of them all right and it was a lot of fun and i really fell in love with the show sharing it meeting people it was hard and it was my first time uh, and i was very uncomfortable of course because i you know at that point in this 2008 i wasn't teaching uh, i was only working full time so i wasn't very comfortable speaking in front of people um you know i was a very introverted individual i liked kind of being on my own sketching and drawing and stuff like this so being out there in these kind of shows was a very new experience so um is it sold out? I don't know. Actually, I'm not quite sure. Uh, if it's not there on superunnyus.com, I would go to Libre Distry. So after this book, I came back to Comic-Con the year afterwards, and I made another one. So this is the book I came back with afterwards. And the reason why I made this book was because people started getting attracted to a certain amount of a certain content I was putting out there on my table. People picked this one up and was like, oh, it's kind of nice, and then put it down and went to that piece, that couple of drawings that I had. And those drawings were of these two characters, this cat and mouse character I called Sprocket and Gear. And these are what the originals looked like. I had them out on the table in 2008. So in 2009, I took those sketches, I scanned them, and I made this book. Now, this time, I actually went to a local printer. Uh, it's, it's not like a copy center, but they're specifically there for printing. It's still kind of like, you know, uh, substandard quality kind of stuff. They're cheaper, if anything else. Um, but I went and did it question here is, you know, how, how did you as an introvert convert into teaching? You think it's very difficult to teach. It is. And it was. In 2008, I was very uncomfortable teaching, but it fell on my lap. Uh, not 2000, I'm sorry, not 2008, 2010. Okay, so 2008 is when I did Comic-Con. I was very kind of like, eh, shaky about it. But teaching-wise, it was 2010. Um, and in 2010 is when I started with that. I still very much felt incompetent about what I was trying to do. But uh, you know, I, I honestly decided to just choose overnight that I had to because uh, the mentor that I had at Art Center uh, is, you know, when he passed away, the, the opportunity to teach at Art Center fell on my lap. And I said, you know, there's no way I'm going to pass it up. So no matter what I felt like, as I was uncomfortable, you know, embarrassed, or, you know, not really quite sure how to explain it, I still went and did it. Okay. And it took me about a year to feel comfortable, to feel confident in what I was trying to go for. Now it's been 10 years. All right. So anyways, I brought this book to 2009 Comic-Con and it sold better. It's because, you know, a book like this one here, people came back to the show and like, oh, I remember those sketches. You know, you had them last year. Uh, so people didn't really buy this one, but they bought this one. That's, you know, I, this is the only copy I have left. The year after that, 2010, I came back with this book, which is a next Sprocket and Gear one. And this one had a little bit of color now uh, of the characters and I made it more digital. And I went back to the same printer um, and produced it. So a lot of these books you're seeing right now at the moment were put together. Uh, first, of course, the sketches were done either digital or on paper, scanned, and then transferred over to Photoshop. So I used Photoshop for most of this work at the moment. I'm going to talk about the, the programs that I use and also uh, then about how I made, made the next steps. So after I put it into Photoshop and I, I organized all the pages, I then took it over to the printer and I, I gave him the file, all right, which was basically uh, an export of a PDF, which were all the single pages. Uh, of course, I didn't know anything about printing. I didn't know anything about bookmaking. So, you know, I had options and stuff like that. And they said, you know, what kind of printing do you want to do? Well, at first I did these two and these kind of books are called saddle stitch books. So when you guys first begin to make uh, your sketchbook, I think a great option is just go for a standard saddle stitch. All right. As you guys are listening in, you can obviously just watch and listen, but if you want to take a few notes, you might want to. Yes, you can rewatch this video again later on, but you might want to just take a few notes here and there just so that, you know, as I'm talking about this stuff, I'm not writing it down for you. Um, so this one here, again, are stapled bound and they're called saddle stitch. They can also be using thread to bind it. And this one, you, you can find it being done at any printer. If you go to a local printers, copy centers, more than likely they can do a saddle stitch. So if you ever went to, let's say a show, convention, expo, or sold things online, a web store, right? Your own little, um, uh, shop, something like that. Making these kind of books are not a huge risk or a heavy commitment. 
if I, I you know I made somebody that made like what 30, 40, 50 copies, uh, each of them probably cost a few dollars per, you know, uh, in terms of pricing. My suggestion would probably be about, you know, between 10 to 15 dollars, uh, depending on the size of the book. These are also about maybe 20 pages, I would say. And that was kind of like the standard what I would find in a lot of sketchbooks that other people were making. So I kind of followed that same kind of template. So those saddle stitch books were pretty approachable and an easy break in to just actually having a physical product. I will say that, you know, doing something like this, let's say you're a student, let's say you're working full time, let's say you're still trying to find your way, producing something and having it in your hand is, is probably the best feeling that you can have. Uh, it just, there's a sense of satisfaction and completion to it. So I think if any of you feel a little bit stuck, or you feel like, I don't know where to go next, you know, like I'm still producing content, I'm still training all the kind of stuff here, great. Uh, but I think even putting something together like this is going to be really good experience for you. Let's say, well, I don't want to, I don't know if I can sell it. I don't really have an audience. Well, that's fine. It's not about really making money though. The idea is about the experience of producing something to start to finish, right? So once I got these books out of the way, when it actually got started rolling, what I'm showing you right now is a year after year after year experience, 2008, 2009, 2010. The 2010 book was a perfect bound book. Saddle stitch, perfect bound. Perfect bound means it's glued on the spine. Okay, so you have a front cover, back cover. It can be soft cover, so meaning it's not stiff as a board. Uh, it's flexible, thin paper. So these are soft cover books. And you have a front and back, which is one sheet, and that is then one spread that can be then bound into it with uh, book glue, essentially. And then um, it holds pretty well together. This is an old book, so so far up to this point, after years and years, pages are not falling out. Uh, after this year in 2010, in 2011, I came back to Comic-Con again, made my other book, third book of Sprocketing Gear. This time I actually made a mini comic. So I wrote the story. You can see the style here is very kind of stylized and cartoony because my range is all over the place. So I do like super crazy sci-fi stuff or fantasy or realism, more technical kind of like, you know, dynamic sketching method to drawing, but then also very kind of like stylized animation friendly kind of things too. So I like drawing all forms of styles. Uh, anyways, you know, this story kind of developed over the many years once people initially wanted to see sketches from the characters at Comic-Con. So I, I brought these back. Of course, I even brought you know, the, the rest of the sketches into the back of the book. And this was also very well received. People seem to like it a lot. Uh, just made a collection of it from the last couple of years into this one. Uh, this one also then went back to the same printer in San Diego. Uh, it doesn't matter which printer it was. It's more just since it's a local printer that you can just go to, you know, give them files and have them print it. This is also a perfect bound book. This is about maybe 30, 40 pages, I would say. Uh, in 2012, I came back again, the fourth year at Comic-Con, and I brought another copy of Sparkling Gear. And this time I continued the comic. And then made more of the story, made more of the little comic uh, explanation of their history and whatnot. Uh, at the back of it, I then introduced a new adventure, a new storyline, a new property. So um, as I then went to these two books, four years, I was producing Sprocketing Gear, right? Sprocketing Gear. Uh, and so these were all self-published. These were all self-published. So I went to the local printer. I made them myself. Uh, I then had them bound and made about maybe 30, 40 copies per, and I took them to the show. Again, I have some of these because I kept one for just archives. A lot of the time they would get sold, I wouldn't make them again. So I would always plan then to the next year afterwards. So here, as I went to 2013, I created this book next, and it was based off of the storyline that I introduced, and I created a whole series of images that was a bit of a visual storytelling of another character. Uh, collected more drawings in the back end, and also had some uh, former students help me out developing it. Same kind of thing. This is a perfect bound book. Uh, it's glue bound, soft cover. These were square, eight by I don't know, about seven by seven, I would say. Uh, and again, like I said, cost wise, relatively low to make. Uh, so question here is, what is the advantage of having a perfect bound book over a saddle stitch book? Presentation. So the saddle stitch book basically looks a little bit kind of um, basic, you know, in terms of the, the binding aspect to it. Professionalism, the, the, the presentation aspect, it just feels better in this kind of, uh, you know, perfect bound. That's not really called stitching, but gluing, I guess, glue bound. And um, it just has a little bit more elevation to quality, you know. What's also beneficial about a perfect bound book like this one is that you can have many more pages. So if the glue, you know, whatever you're gluing together with pages, it can be 30 pages, 40 pages, 80 pages, and it'll still hold well. With a stitched saddle stitch book, you can only have so many pages because it's got to fold a large piece of paper. This is eight by 11, let's say, and we fold it in half to staple it. 
So it can only hold so many pages because it gets, if it's too thick, you gotta be able to trim it, but also the binding will start to open up a lot more, right? So that's one of the plus sides of the perfect bound book compared to the saddle stitch. The saddle stitch is probably your best approach in terms of breaking into it though, okay? So after I did those books over there, in my 2014 year, I then ventured into hardcover books. I decided, you know what, I wanna go a little bit bigger. And so um, the kind of paper, usually it's an option from the paper store. So they say, you know, what kind of paper do you wanna use? It's based on what they have available. That's all it is. So it's either like semi-gloss, glossy paper, matte paper. I usually use semi-gloss paper, all right? I don't like super shiny. And sometimes I like matte, but the matte paper that, you know, a certain printer might have is maybe quality wise can be a little bit poor. And that's due to maybe thickness or thinness, right? So I never used ISBNs for my books. I just self-published them and I sold them out of my own, uh, you know, kind of like ways of, of the booth. I never sold these online. Uh, I never, well, scratch that. I never sold these online. I just only went to the, the booth at Comic-Con and only sold them then. And that was it. It was only available at the shows. Afterwards, if they sold, they were sold. A lot of times I only made them once, one copy run. And once they were done, I never printed them again. So as I came back to 2014 years, I made another book. Now, at this point, I was teaching for an, about three years at this point. And what I decided to do was make a book that was more focused on my educational stuff, you know, my classes that I was teaching. And I put together a, a bunch of photographs of my chalkboard sketches. So this is at like Art Center, the Concept Design Academy, of the drawings that I would show in process of dynamic sketching. This is in 2014. So I felt I thought like, you know, something like this doesn't really exist, you know, chalkbook, draw, uh, chalkbook art kind of ways. Uh, and also just like process of dynamic sketching. Um, there was no book on it at all at that time. And the only place that was being taught of dynamic sketching was either at Art Center or at Concept Design Academy through me. So I put this book together and I thought, man, this is gonna be expensive though. You know, I kind of priced it in per, overall if I made about, let's say a thousand copies, right? So these ones, I was making like 20, 30, 40 books. Now, what if I have leftover shows? I just kept them, archived them. Or sometimes I'll bring it back to a show essentially. So I came back where I came to Comic-Con in 2014 and I had these books, but the only reason I was able to make it because the cost was so high is that I went to Kickstarter. So I went to Kickstarter with this book and I made my first Kickstarting campaign. And uh, I raised about $3,000 for the book. Overall, it cost $3,000 to make the book. I produced 200 copies of this. Uh, and once I made 200 copies, that's all I made. So I went to Comic-Con 2014, sold them all. So I had like one or two copies left. This is the only copy I have. You can kind of see how it's bent up right now. Um, I wish I had more. Unfortunately, the binding, uh, this is where I learned in my lessons. The first thing was with Kickstarter, it's actually a very good option in my opinion. I think even as a young person for someone like, well, I don't know if I can afford this stuff. I mean, I get it. I can spend like maybe 150 bucks, 200 bucks making these kind of like books here. Great introduction, awesome. Low risk, you know, they can use those books, you know, progressively into the future if I go to different shows. But something like this, I'm spending like three grand on, you know, I'm producing like 200 copies of this, you know, and, and I don't know if that's going to be worth it. So with Kickstarter, I had never done it before. All right. It was my first time with Instagram and social media. I wasn't using it. I wasn't on Instagram. Okay. All I had was Facebook and what was it? The, the deviant art. <laughs> that's all I had. All right. So there was no way for me to actually even promote this. So I had to make it and just kind of hope that, Hey, I hope the Kickstarter works out. I just learned my way as, as I kind of did it. So the Kickstarter goes up. I actually hit my goal, $3,000. I could have made a lot more, but that's a whole other story in terms of the, the <laughs> Kickstarter experience. But anyways, I made 200 copies of the book, went to Comic-Con, but the printing wasn't really that great. The paper was okay, printing-wise, and this is a perfect bound book, by the way. Hardcover, perfect bound. But the gluing wasn't very nice. Uh, I went to the same company, the printer that did these books over here, but because these are soft cover, the binding held a lot stronger. So with the Kickstarter, how did I promote it? I didn't, I just started it and it was out there and I would just hope it would do okay. <laughs> That's all I could rely on. I shared it on my, on my Facebook, my, pe my personal friends and like, hey, can you guys share this on your Facebook? And that was it, all right? Uh, how do you decide how much to charge for products like books? Research. So if I research similar books, hardcover, let's say it's about 80 pages, uh, educational, I look at other books that are similar to it, I'm going to price it around the same, right? So this book costs uh, on market to, the, to, let's say, the people out there, uh, the customers, at about $25, all right? To produce the book, all right? So to, to make books, essentially, like this, someone like this here, I went to the printer and said, you know what, I want to make like 200 copies. How much is it going to cost me? 
and they'll give you the cost of it based on the, the paper, based on the ink, based on the color of black and white, the sizing dimension, uh, and of course, the, obviously the labor of it, right? So it ended up costing about three grand. Now the cost of it overall can go further down by units. So the more units you produce, the cost of overall per unit can come down further. Um, if you make less, a short run, let's say I made like 50 of these books, the cost could have gone up much higher. So that's usually the way it work, works in book printing, that you make a large run, the per unit cost for out of your pocket can be much smaller. If you have a small run, larger cost. But the thing is, even if you make a large run of this, you'd be like, well, that's, that's still going to cost me like way more, even though each per unit might cost me, let's say like five bucks to make. This one cost me $10 per unit. Okay. And I sold it at 25. Uh, then I can be like, you know, still like, I don't have the money to be able to afford that, even if it was just, you know, a fraction of the cost of it. So then you have to find the balance of how many can I produce, right? And how much can I afford? Uh, there's no ISBN, enough for this one. And there's no copies of this anymore. But anyways, so once I made the Kickstarter though, and I got it out there, I, mean, I had enough money just for the short run of this one. Sold it, but again, the printing wasn't very good. And eventually as I opened it over the years, what happened, the pages would start to fall out. And the glue wasn't very good. You see, it's like white glue right there. It, you can hear it crack at times. So you open it, you hear it crack, and the pages start to fall out of it. I was like, man, this is not going to work. So I started, you know, looking to the future about, okay, I'm going to keep producing more books. So I started looking at other options. It's about 4:30. We're about five, ten more minutes about this stuff. I went to a, uh, I went to my next book. This is the sketchbook that I produced. Oh, that's very true. You know, in terms of. Uh, the whole used book market and stuff like that. But here's the thing. I was doing this in my uh, early 20s. And I had no idea what the hell I was doing. <laughs> okay. Um, and I was making books, making small stuff, going to Comic-Con. I was only selling it at Comic-Con. I wasn't going to like bookstores and stuff like this. Hey, do you want to carry it? I wasn't doing that. Um, but yeah, so I had no idea exactly what I was trying to do. I just knew that I wanted to make books. I only made it for Comic-Con. So in 2014, I decided you know, I was drawing insanely, like every single day, producing hundreds and hundreds of drawings. And at the end of that year, I collected it all together and I made my official sketchbook, the 2014-15 year book. But with this one, I decided, you know what? I don't wanna go back to that printer again, all right? And I'm gonna to go to a bound book. So this is a Coptic stitch book. So the first one was a saddle stitch. The second one book was a perfect bound book. This is a open binding Coptic stitch, C-O-P-T-I-C. Coptic stitch essentially is bound by signature. So the way to think about it is imagine if you had a bunch of uh, these saddle stitch books, right? And a bunch of these are individually called signatures. So you have like, you know, six, seven, eight signatures of individual pages all uh, kind of stacked up like this and you will stack them on top of each other and you will stitch them essentially. So as you stitch it, you have this one complete book. Now the benefit of a Coptic stitch, which is sewn, is that you can lay it flat anywhere you go to the book. And this is about a 300 page sketchbook. So anywhere you turn to the book, it'll lay flat. That's the benefit, right? Lay flat. So once I made this book, I went to Kickstarter again because I felt like I don't have the money again to produce you know, a thousand copy of these things. So I went to Kickstarter and I priced out to a local um, printer, not local, I'm sorry, a printer actually out in Asia. They were based out in China. Uh, they were a Korean based company that printed in China. And I asked them like, you know, I'm trying to produce these high number of pages. I want this kind of binding. Can you do it? And they said, yeah, we can. So I asked them, okay, I want to make this many copies. And can you give me an estimate? So I first talked to the printer and finding a good printer is a pain in the ass. That's the first hurdle you kind of have to get over. I mean, let alone making the actual book, right? Or the, the artwork for the book. So finding that printer was through contacts. Person that I knew said, hey, look at these people, go check them out. So I reached out to them, got an estimate, and they said it'll cost X amount. I said, all right, cool. So I put this then on uh, Kickstarter, and I raised then the amount of funding because then it was successful again, and uh, I made this book. So this was all, again, through my own. I made the book, did all, obviously the artwork for it. I designed it. I went to the printer. Uh, I, I promoted it, marketed it through my Instagram. And at that point, I, I, mean, I had a, maybe a couple thousand followers on Instagram, right? That's all. And um, I made the book, and it came out great. I was, I was really happy with this one because people were really interested in buying this. And I, I like that because this is now all personal work. It wasn't educational. It wasn't like a story thing. It was just sketches and drawings and all, and, it, and people bought it and they really seemed to enjoy it. So I was really happy with the way this one came out and the way this one was um, received. 
This one, unfortunately, is again not available anymore. But I'm hoping to produce another sketchbook in the future. I have a lot of sketches I have not scanned yet and shown. So, anyways, that was my official sketchbook I made in 2014-15. Here after that, 2016, that's where the first dynamic Bible comes in. So in 2015, I started drawing six months of all my notes of Dynamic Bible. I went back to the same Asian printer and they said, you know what, you know, I want to make another book with you guys. And I can make uh, another perfect bound book, soft cover. It's all educational, but I was looking for a watercolor book. So like I actually was talking with them. They sent me a bunch of samples. So when you guys talk to your printers, you can actually have them send you samples as well too. You're like, you know what, I want something more specific and controlled. What kind of paper types do you guys have? Can you send me a few of them? And I would just see which options I'm going to go for. As you also print, eventually, as you become more professional with this stuff, proofing becomes more important too. Honestly, even if you go to a local printer, they'll give you a proof. And a proof is, hey, here's a copy. Tell us what you think. Are the colors right? You know, is the sizing okay? Is the binding correct? And then if you approve it, saying, okay, let's go for a run now, start printing. So this is a book I made at the, the first Dynamic Bible on my own, self-published. And uh, it took six months to actually make the work. Took it to the printer in Asia, and they took about maybe three months to print it and bind it. Then they had to ship it to me. Okay, so um, so the question here is: did, did the printers handle the deliveries, shipping the purchasers, or did you need to figure that out? Good question, Ranger. So as I went to the first sketchbook and the Dynamic Bible, all the other previous books I just showed you guys, I would go to conventions, Comic Con, to sell the book. Right? These two books I did on Kickstarter. No, yeah, Kickstarter, because even the the, the chalk book wasn't shipped online. It was all local, essentially. Actually, no. A couple of them were shit, but it was only US. But these two books were heavy runs at about 1,000 to 1,500 copies, all right? And um, when I did that, I didn't realize, like, okay, I have to actually now figure out how to get them to people's hands, <laughs> you know? So uh, as I sold these, and I went to Comic-Con and stuff like that, uh, I had stacks and stacks and stacks of orders. And I spent months shipping them out of my, you know, at, at going to like a local uh, USPS store. And I had to pack them on myself. I had to print out all the labels. I had to take them 80 copies at a time in my car, drop them off at USPS. And I did it for like months. It was, I, I don't recommend it to anybody, okay? It's, it's horrible. Um, it's a lot of work, insane amount of work. So what you can do now, if you do plan to do a Kickstarter, is that you can hire uh, distributors and fulfillment agents. So if you go to someone, let's say uh, like the White Squirrel, White Squirrel is also a, film, a fulfillment agent that can actually take your campaign and help you fulfill your orders. Now you, they take a certain percentage of what you know, is being done through the Kickstarter or you would pay them a certain percentage per book you ship. But trust me, the storage, the shipping, the packing, all that stuff being handled by somebody else, highly recommend it, all right? Now, again, I know that you must be thinking at the moment, it's like, well, I don't know if I'm ready for do, you know, doing any of this kind of stuff. Of course not. Neither was I. At first, I started off with this, just going to local shows, all right? But once I got a bit more comfortable and I started producing more you know, things, then I had to start you know, using Kickstarter. Then I had to start using Instagram. Then I had to start using potential distributors. But I was still going to like Comic Cons and shows selling this stuff. The book does well. You know, obviously, everything still here up to this point is all self-published. Uh, and I was very much enjoying the overall experience. So as I continued on, I'll show you not my latest stuff. <clears throat> By the way, these books right here, these are the original Dynamic Bible uh, first one for first books. So these are the original sketchbooks. Uh, these are the ones I spent six months working in, drawing. These are the original watercolor inks and whatnot. The sketchbook is beat up as hell, it's falling apart right now. Um, but I got to archive this thing and protect it. Uh, these are the original pages original sketchbook, filled up two of them for the Dynamic Bible, the first one. So you start to see with this one, what's a little bit different now is that the pages are organized for printing. For these ones over here, I'm essentially cutting out stuff, putting it inside the page, right? Uh, separate individual images being brought together and collaged in Photoshop at first. This one, I'm now preemptively designing the page out. So I gotta just scan it, clean it up, redo the, some of the text, and then go straight to the printing file. This is the original uh, pages of the current Dynamic Bible, the one that's out right now. I have them in this uh, for protection. 
So these are all the originals. So it's all loose sheets. And I go straight in into all these pages. Loose sheets, just Bristol paper, right? Just like this. Now I scan them. Usually scanning wise for any of your work, I would suggest minimally, minimally 400 resolution, 400 DPI, all right? Um, that's gonna be print quality. And a lot of the times I print at 600. No, I'm print, I'm sorry, scan at 600. Oh, by the way, this is a, a little mini, oops, come on, focus. There we go. This is the uh, little dynamic Bible book that I made companion-wise back then with the uh, original dynamic Bible. This is the current new one, of course, that you guys are seeing. And this one still is available at superanius.com and Liberty Distry. So everything is now coming to the culmination of this. And this is actually my first book where I went through another publisher. Every single book I've shown you up to this point has been self-published. You know, going through Kickstarter, funding it myself, paying for it myself, delivering, shipping, packing all those myself, going to Comic-Con, selling it there. This is my first book where I've actually gone through uh, into the actual publisher. So this is in 2020. So for over, you know, what, since 2008, over 10 years, I've been producing my own books, self-publishing it. And it's a lot of work, but again, I will tell you, that the actual reward from it, the experience learned from just producing content and actually finishing the work itself is really, really satisfying. So how do we actually now consider even, you know, uh, going forward and, and making the proper content? Like how, what kind of book should I make? You know, what, how, how do I lay out my pages and stuff like that? Well, let's just do one demo here of a drawing on a sketch page to kind of talk about even that, all right? So at this point, we're gonna draw. We got about 30 minutes left, maybe like 20 minutes. I'll try to keep it clean and quick. Sorry, these one hour talks, it, it just goes so fast. Uh, so 400 just for the highest resolution, you know, it can be. Uh, it's pretty standard in terms of printing, you know, 400 is mostly recommended for prints or books, such like this. It's, it's honestly, uh, you know, again, safer to just go higher re uh, resolution scanning so you can downscale. And you, you definitely don't want to upscale at all, right? What I'm going to show you guys right now is page layouts. If you ever plan to print a book and you wanted to make your own small little sketchbook, right? And you wanted to go to a show and sell it, how you can prepare to make things a little bit easier for yourself is to preemptively design your page a bit better. And I'm talking about like sketchbooks that you can put together, right? So don't, you know, don't think of this as like a comic book or like a graphic novel kind of thing or uh, some type of like uh, themed kind of story-based thing. It's just a sketchbook, a collection of your drawings. But still, yeah, you can sketch a bunch of stuff individually and bring them together and collage it. But also like actually designing your page as a cohesive movement is something I would also recommend. Here's one book in which it can kind of show you an example of that. Uh, some of this content has been shared on my Instagram years ago. Uh, this book was a, a hand bound book that a student gave to me as a present years ago. And I filled it up with a bunch of monsters. And this, each of these uh, spreads, I've consciously chose where things are gonna go. Now, what I do when it comes to a lot of my page layouts is I group them into the blocks of threes, all right? So the rule of thirds is something you see in design a lot of times, and uh, you'll see it in things like the rule of third compositions, but I also use it in terms of blocking layouts. So here, I have three blocks, one, two, three. The first block normally goes into like light sketching, loose exploration, silhouette studies, base shapes. My secondary block typically went to things like specific focus, head study, call outs, detail information, right? Or taking something from before and expanding on it. The third block ended up always being like the render piece or the singular drawing that became the focus. So I don't literally draw a line in here to block out the page, but I'm already consciously spacing out where things are go. Then I'll start to use things like text or spot imagery to help blend things together, right? Another page. One, two, three. Sketch, thumbnail, shape, silhouette, body form. Two, increase scale, push a bit more detail, get a bit of color, overlapped on top for just blending. Third block, more detail, heavy render, larger piece. One, two, three. Side view thumbnails, head study callouts, posing. Final shot, more render. So in this book, I repeatedly use this over and over and over again. One, two, three. Sometimes I do 
One, two, three. One, two, three. And the blocking of it from one, two to three can be organized in any way you want to. Now the, the third block, three blocks, it doesn't have to always be consistently that. You can bring it down to just two blocks. It could just be one image on a page and you can break up the read of your sketchbook you know, in that manner where it's just like a single image, double image or more. But if you have many, many sketches and drawings that you wanna put on the page, the organization of where things go really helps clarify what you're gonna go see, right? One, two, three. One, two, three. So this, this rhythm, this is just one image now, one block. So yeah, that can be, you know, of course, an issue in terms of technical means of drawing, but first it depends, it's all dictated by layout first, readability and layout. If you're afraid of smudging and stuff like that, just use paper on top so you don't have to smudge it basically, right? On top of the ink, or just wait till it dries. One, two, three. One, two, three. So let's do that one right now. Let's actually block out a page in sketchbook. Let's do the typical kind of placement of where things go. Let's block it out. One, two, three. Let's design a vehicle or draw a vehicle. So let's do a, uh, to make the presentation a bit cleaner, things like using rulers and things like hard edges. It's okay, you can do that. I'm gonna use that for the ground plane. Usually, again, I said step number one, first block will be things like side view. So let's do like a some kind of crazy uh, race car or something like that. Like a classic looking 20, 30 race car, but it's also stylized. I want to play with things like shapes, proportions, forms. I don't know, early one, it's just kind of exploring what that might possibly be. Okay, let's do another one now. So here, let's make the wheels a bit more medial. Let's go a little bit higher, I don't know, weird proportioning, just playing around. Near the driver will sit inside here. Okay, let's do that. Let's go and do this next one. Let's go lower profile. Let's go speed form. Possibly, I might use that possibly, but again, this first layer is just for me to kind of see what's possible with the direction of a visual look of this vehicle form, all right? Block one, block two. Let's take this body form and let's kind of turn it in space a little bit. I don't even care about the wheels right now. I just want to figure out like the body shape. So here's now block two in this section. Let's just turn it. And what I want to do at this point is kind of like draw through a little bit find some sort of like internal silhouette and shape. Let's block out some three-dimensional forms. This is just a body shape. Wheels will be attached here and here. It's like some kind of crazy, weird, you know, like I said, Roadster, like not a roadster, but uh, those 20s and 30s race cars that were just open wheels and just a bullet like shape of the body. And that's just one body type. Let's do another one. So, again, filling up section number two. Let's kind of change the angle a little bit. Let's go a bit flatter, but still three dimensional. So, we'll raise up the body form. I kind of want to do the second one again, but change up the silhouette just slightly. Let's add three dimensions to it. So in these kind of early parts of the sketches, block one, block two, I'm not really concerned about like line quality or you know how pretty it needs to be. I'm just trying to find out what it, you know is going to be within direction. Like what do I even want to go for, right? I'm trying to make decisions. So I'm not super concerned about aesthetics. I'm trying to find a design direction of shape and form. Let's do another one body form here. Let's do that first one again, but this time let's change the angle going this way. Maybe the cockpit will go here. I 
That's a pretty nice little shape right there. Wheels go here and here. Okay, now that I have the exploration of side views and three quarter view just body types, now third block, right? So you start to see the pattern that kind of emerges in terms of how I'm working on the page. Now, any leftover space I have, I'm gonna include notes. So this is uh, body form, let's say called C, it's body form A and B. The thing about the written thing is that it doesn't have to even be legible. It's just more of a visual thing that's there. Uh, so don't be super concerned about like if it looks good or not. Um, let's just say like vehicle signs. Let's go to the third shot now. A uh, couple questions first is, uh, do character designers draw finished backgrounds or scenes where characters simply tell a story in the entertainment and video game industry? Uh, character designers usually do not draw backgrounds. They draw the characters, right? So if it's an animation, that's specifically what they're going to do, and it's all they'll stay in. Oh, nice to see you there, John Albert. Let's see. Let's go to a shot where we have... You know, a perspective that's going to go like this direction, just push up the body form this way, and kind of indicate lightly here. And right now I'm just drawing straight in with pen. And in this, you know, method of filling in sketchbooks and whatnot, whatever technique or tool set that you have, obviously use it, you know, that's not really the concern. Uh, you know, some people ask about like, you know, to help build confidence, you know, should I use pen and stuff like this? I mean, yeah, it helps a lot. Uh, but understand that right now what we're talking about is the idea of being able to lay out the page to explore your sketches, explore ideas. And in that sense, don't worry so much about, you know, what it is you're drawing with, but just be mindful, you know, Let's do ellipses here, here, and here. And we'll start to fill in some initial details internally here. I'm going to start to kind of incorporate some mechanics of parts and pieces to the vehicle at about maybe 10 minutes. So need to keep track of it. See if there's any other questions here. Uh, what are speed forms? So forms that basically communicate and express a sense of speed, right? So a speed form could be based on things of nature. Thick to thin, straight to curves. Imagine a bird silhouette, right? It's a speed form. A fish silhouette. So nature could be one of the inspirations of what you look at for that. Now, this is, again, not really a full design process. Um, as I've mentioned in the past and the other uh, workshops that I've done, you know, in terms of design, you really need a prompt. I need a full kind of like a written, I guess, uh, foundation to be able to understand what to go for, to what you need to actually visually, you know, commit to. With this one, we're just having an idea of like some kind of race-like vehicle. Who knows what it is, but uh, it's just more fun to just kind of create things and draw stuff. And this is again about how I can use that opportunity to you know, really maximizing the page. And so that way when things are placed down, it doesn't feel so random. It doesn't feel so, you know, uh, I guess spontaneous maybe. And spontaneity can be good, obviously, right? And it's not to say that every single sketchbook and sketch page has to follow something like this. Uh, but the idea is that if you ever wanna like print something, you know, and you wanna put together a sketchbook that you wanna sell or 
promote and market, or even show, share on things like social media and having a little bit of that mindfulness of layout, organization, it just gives it another little extra bump in quality. And it also communicates just a little bit more, uh, you know, like I said, confidently as well too. I'm gonna go in there and start to kind of punch some darks as well and kind of get this a bit more detail fleshed out. So I have a lot of other sketchbooks that are just like, you know, a single image and tons of detail and very kind of fleshed out and finished. Um, but it's also really nice to have some that are just more based on a lot of exploration, trying to figure things out and, and giving your sketchbook a moment to be able to just breathe and move around and try stuff but also feel you know interconnected and interwoven so that shows it shows a lot of unity and cohesiveness so if you've never ever thought about being able to just organize your sketchbook right do so and then once you feel ready about the content you produced you feel like it, it you know it captures a certain theme and so that would i would be you know the next thing to kind of mention to talk about now is like we talk about layout and we talk about where we can put our sketches and how we can kind of approach them in terms of what they kind of represent these blocks and whatnot. But it's like, you know, what kind of book should I even make? I, mean, I get that I can make a sketchbook or something like this, but um, is there anything else I could do to maybe even like have it stand out or, you know, kind of like stand on its own where it doesn't really fall into this category of what everyone else is kind of doing. And that's something that you kind of have to brainstorm a little bit, but that is a valid kind of thought, which is, you know, do you, and do you just end up making another sketchbook and does it get lost into the ether of all this other content that's out there, right? So then what could you offer? What could you put together that might be, let's say, unique enough or something that really wasn't touched upon enough that it starts to, you know, attract attention or has a certain niche of a market, maybe a large market that people are very interested in, you know, purchasing and getting from you. So for instance, you know, having themes, right? Themes of things like, creatures or vehicles or uh, subject matter. It could also be based on something educational. When I think, well, I'm not really a teacher. Well, that's fine. You can just explain the things that you just enjoy doing. Uh, this is how I you know, approach drawing you know, um, I don't know, animal studies and stuff like that. Because it's not like you're trying to you know, uh, do this large, you know, massive uh, run and release of something. It's just a very personal kind of experience and venture for you. So in that case, in situations, like whatever you find interesting, you should be able to just pursue. And don't worry so much about like, you know, like I said, is it gonna compete to the other more professional things that are out there? As long as it's something personal, it stands out, it's unique. It could also be you know, somewhat similar themes, but just something that really brings a bit of your personality into it, uniqueness. I think that's something to really consider, you know? So for me, a lot of the books that I made you know, started off with just random sketches, that first book. And then from there, it went into like characters that I thought were kind of interesting. And also a little bit based on maybe a bit of feedback from, you know, an audience or people that were out there at Comic-Con. But still, you know, I, I kind of latched onto it. I found it very fun to do. And I continue. So here's a sketch page that has like side view and this kind of angle over here and whatnot. You know, how do you determine to add color or not uh, just preference or is it printing color more expensive? So yeah, that's a good also, uh, question as well. And your first book, I think going black and white would be highly recommended because the cost will come dramatically down. Uh, color books, color printing is also a nightmare in terms of like color matching. In terms of my recommendations for like the, after you scan, the, the programs that you should be using to put books together, I use Photoshop to collage, clean up, uh, and basically bring up the quality of the overall scan, you know? You know, color correction, and then like this, Photoshop. But from there, once I save all the, uh, the images out from Photoshop, I import them into InDesign. If you guys are really, truly interested in maybe making books in the future for yourself, learn some tutorials. You know, you can find them on YouTube or, or whatever the case is. Just learn a little bit about InDesign. InDesign is the, the primary, you know, program you'd want to use for book layout. It's made for it, okay? And it's one of the, the better ones in terms of being able to actually um, produce your own. It's not that difficult, but uh, please do consider using that, okay? 
What inspires me the most these days is the last question. How do you see your art evolving in the near future? Uh, these days, a lot of it is still very much my own, you know, personal interests of things I've had in the past. Uh, the old movies or comics and things that I've watched and played with uh, as a kid still very much inspire me the same way. A huge portion, of course, then is the nature, getting outside, traveling heavily. Now, of course, we haven't really traveled in the last two years because of the whole, you know, quarantine pandemic thing. But, um, you know, it's going to open up again at some point. And I hope to do a lot more international travel, doing workshops and whatnot. Uh, and I am going to Africa on Monday, so <laughs> I am doing my travels already. Um, but more of it is something I'm looking forward to because that's a huge part of me gaining a massive amount of, um, you know, enthusiasm and also drive to produce things. But where does it evolve from there? Uh, for me, it's about being more efficient, even more confident, uh, producing things of higher quality. Uh, and, and, you know, if anything else, inspiring others to do better because if I want people to do even better work than me because that will also then turn and drive me to even try to push as hard as possible as well, right? Anyways sketch page layout. Instead of randomly throwing and spilling your pages onto that, you can now really control where things go. Scan this up, clean it, put some text here and there, right? Solid. So then if you have a 20 page sketchbook, you saddle bound, print 20, 30 of them, have an actual printed book, a product. You are now in your first step to go into something of a bigger world, all right? So that's how I started my books. That's how I started my first initial steps into this whole industry, working on my own, all personal studies and personal adventures. And it's available for anybody. So once you begin to start up your Instagrams and social medias, it doesn't matter how many followers you get. And yes, more does, of course, help. But you need content. You need products. And the more you make, the more people start to look at what you're doing. All right? Not just random things that are being thrown around. Um, good luck to you all. All right. Thank you guys for joining. I really do hope you uh, found the information useful, helpful. You can watch the video again later on if you missed some things in the beginning. Um, and thank you to Kazone and Superani to be able to actually work with me and collaborate. And I hope to see you guys real soon and we'll see you at the next talk. Thank you guys.